Uh, there we go. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I want to start the session with a statement. I'm just not the creative type. I want you to think, have you ever said it? Or more importantly, have you ever thought it? Because I'd be willing to bet we've all said it. We've all thought it. Um, but here's the thing. We are all the creative type. Every single one of us, we were born with the ability to be creative. But what happens is creativity is like a muscle. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And the good news is creativity is like a muscle, which means with consistent, intentional, deliberate practice, you can get it back and in a big way. And so um, I wanna explore how you practice in an intentional way on your creative and innovative thinking. I also think that it's important to identify what creativity is and what it is not. For our purposes, creativity is not creating great pieces of artwork. Um, it's not coming up with the next big business idea. Creativity is solving problems. Um, creativity is finding ways to express yourself artistically. Um, it's finding way to solve a stubborn problem that's been plaguing a business or an organization. So creativity is not magical or mysterious. It's a process that can be replicated and again, practiced. And that's what all of us do in our classrooms. We help our students practice the creative process. And so what I hope to do today is to share some ways that I've tried to work on this creative process with my students. And I hope you'll share things that you've done or maybe want to do. And we're gonna walk out of that virtual door with swagger, armed with some, I hope, practical tools you can take back to your learning space and put to use immediately to elevate your creative game. So um, I have a, a picture that I wanna show you because as I look at this picture, so many emotions, so many emotions. But um, so this is a picture of my husband and I with some of our graduates from last May. And whenever I see pictures like this, a couple of things happen. First of all, I, I get kind of sniffly because I always get really connected with the students. And you know, I get sad when it's time for them to leave even though that's the whole point. But the other thing that these kinds of pictures do for me is they remind me of my hopes and expectations for those graduates. I want our graduates to go out into the world and make a huge difference. But I know in order for them to be able to do that, they have to have creative and innovative thinking skills. And so I wanna explore how we can help them get even better at being creative and innovative. Something else this picture does for me, it brings up a, a, a graduate story of my own. And it kind of explains why I'm very passionate about teaching creative and innovative thinking. Um, so I graduated with degrees in accounting. My first job out of college was an auditor. I was an auditor for a public accounting firm in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I, I remember on one of my first audits, I was charged with reconciling an account. And I thought, yes, I've done this a million times in class. I can do this until I couldn't. I struggled. I got so frustrated. I could not get the account to reconcile. And I remember my audit manager, his name was Jed. And Jed chuckled at me. And I was offended. You know, I'm like, Jed, why are you laughing at me? I can't get this account to reconcile. And he says, have you explained the major differences? I said, yes. And he says, you won't be able to reconcile that account. And I don't want you to document your findings and move on. And it was shocking to me that he told me to move on and not balance to the penny. And what I realized was that I had allowed myself to be trained to focus on finding the one correct, right answer. And that I was gonna be faced with so much gray that things weren't gonna be as black and white as I had thought. And I said, I let myself because my professors tried, they tried to show me the gray, but I, I had focused so much on that black and white that it was a real slap in the face when Jed chuckled at me, but I learned. I learned that in the accounting world, there are absolutely moments when there is a one correct answer, but there's also lots of areas that are gray, that you have to use your professional judgment, creative and innovative thinking to solve that problem. And the professionals, the successful professionals, they know the difference. And I always tell my students that, I always impart that to them, that it's so important that they know when to, when to use that professional judgment. So I got to thinking, like, how could I put into words my expectations of our graduates? 
So, you know, I got to thinking, what if I looked up Kansas State University graduate in the dictionary? What would I want it to say? So many things, right? But for today, here's what I came up with. This is my hope, my expectation for my graduates. Um, they're creative and innovative thinkers and they're problem solvers. So they can go out and make a difference in our world. So what I do in my classroom is I kind of look at it as a fitness program. I love going to the gym. It is my thing. And so this speaks to me. Um, I talk to my students about how they have to practice creative and innovative thinking every single day. They have to practice it or they'll lose it. Again, it's like a muscle. And so as we do activities in class, I ask them, how are you going to add this into your program? How are you going to do this in your everyday? And so um, from my perspective, as I help my students build up their fitness program, so to speak, I'm very cognizant of naming why we're doing something. So if I bring an activity into class to focus on creative and innovative thought, I name it. I tell them why we're doing it. I tell them why it's so important. I try to make the activity memorable and fun. And I do it over and over and over. Um, maybe in an almost obnoxious way, but I want them to remember why it's so very important. And I want them to take away that, that value. I think sometimes, I know this is true for me, sometimes I'll do things in the classroom that are counterintuitive if in fact I love creative and innovative thinking. Like I do things that might squash it. And this semester it hit me, I've been teaching 28 years, always hand out um, a sheet that shows them the end of chapter exercises and problems that we'll be working together in class. And you know what? There's a check figure for each one of these at the end of the textbook. What am I doing, right? So I got to thinking, again, it's important. There are moments when there is that one right answer, but there's also the gray. And so I've included a new statement, a new pledge on this very sheet. And it's for a strategic reason. So I'll let you kind of look through it, but it's all about creative problem solving on their page of problems that we will be working. And my plan is we'll work the exercise or problem, we'll find that answer, and then I'm going to talk to them and discuss what circumstances might create some gray. So if, if we're out in the, in the real world, what, what could create some questions where we have to use our creative and innovative thought to solve the problem? So um, what I thought we would do is use these statements as an outline for our day today. I'm going to share with you some examples from each one of these items, and I hope you'll share things that you do in your classroom. And look at that Forbes cover, isn't that cool? I know, it's a goal. Okay, so here's our list. We're gonna run through it today at a rapid fire pace. The first one is I push past the obvious answers. How do we teach our students to do that, to, to flex their creative muscle? I've got a couple of activities I wanted to share with you. Both of them center around the number 100, all right? Um, this semester, second week in, second week in, I walked in with 10 pages and I handed them out and I asked my students to crowdsource 100 questions they had about accounting. Now, these are non-majors. They'd been with me for two weeks and I asked them to come up with 100 questions that they have about accounting and they did not disappoint. A couple of reasons I had them do this and then I'll, I'll tell you how I'm gonna use it, but I wanted them to practice brainstorming. No matter what your chosen field is, you need to have that ability to brainstorm and to lead others in a, in a good brainstorm. And they absolutely got to do that that day. And I also wanted them to see how creative their answers got once they got the initial answers done, right? What's an asset? What's a liability? After that, you get to the good stuff. There are always nuggets. Something else they learned is that it's important to have an environment where people feel confident throwing out crazy ideas. Because again, that's where you find the magic. So I wanted to share a few of these because I, I thought they were pretty cool. Um, I'll have to interpret this person's writing for you, but I like this question. It says, why doesn't everyone want to be an accountant? Great question. Now you might say it's flippant, right? Yes, but I'm going to, on Fridays, pull, pull a few of these questions and answer them. And so for this one, I'm gonna flip it a bit and say, here's some qualities that a successful accountant needs to have. Here's the strengths that a successful accountant needs to have. Here's what a normal day looks like, because it's not for everybody. 
And so I'm going to take that question that they came up with and I'm going to answer it. Um, near the bottom of this page, a couple of other really good ones. How much does an accountant make? Same kind of a, a thing. On a Friday, I'm going to pull a couple of these questions and talk about the salaries that they can expect as an accountant. Here's some more. What's the best way to not get caught doing something illegal? Flippant, yes, but I'm going to talk about what types of systems do accountants put into place so things like that are less likely to happen. Again, there's nuggets in every one of these, and I, I want to show that to the students and, and teach them that. Um, can a left-handed accountant be trusted? All right, creative question. Again, a little flippant, but I'm going to build on the trust piece, and I'm going to share with them how important an accountant's reputation is and how you can maintain it and what happens when it's lost. Um, Luca Pacioli is the father of accounting and my students know that. Um, and so someone asked when his birthday was, if you are wondering, <clears throat> it's in November and yes, we will be celebrating. And so I, I take the opportunity to talk about Luca Pacioli. It's a very historical event. And so we will be discussing the history of accounting. Um, and I thought this was great in the global economy. How does accounting differ in different countries? It's absolutely a relevant creative question. Um, again, you might look at this and say it's flippant. What is a bean and why is it counted? But interestingly enough, accountants are called bean counters and there's a historical reason why. And so on a Friday this semester, we'll be talking about the history of, of that reference. Um, how do you become a CPA and do creative CPAs land you in jail? Again, somewhat flippant, but we're going to talk about what happens when a CPA does break the rules. Do they lose their license? How does it impact others? And what's your, your role in it? So all of these questions have some nuggets that I can hit on one of my Fridays in class. Um, I liked these two taken together. Can you do accounting while skydiving? Huh? And are there freelance accountants? In today's gig economy, these are pretty legitimate questions. Can you do accounting outside of an office is where I'm going with this. And we're going to talk about that. What are some opportunities for you to be an accountant, but not in a traditional way? So that was one of my activities. Another that I've done in class is I will walk in and say, hey, what if I need you to come up with a practical to use a paperclip? Not just one practical way, but a hundred. Could you do it? And we'll take five, 10 minutes and we'll brainstorm. And again, my, my point is we need to learn how to brainstorm, how to create an environment where you're ready and willing to give out some crazy responses because that's where you find the magic. So those are a couple of ways that I use the 100 in my class. The so what, why, why do I do this? Why did I have them come up with a hundred questions? Why did I ask them how to use a paperclip in a hundred ways? We talk about this in class. I, I want them to know you got to push past that point, right? Past the basic answers and get to the really good stuff. And you got to be willing to do that. I often liken it like you're tired. You've been busy all day. You get home and you think, what am I going to cook for supper? Your first answer not the best. Usually try to push through to a couple more and you're going to have a much better meal. It's the same idea. I always end these activities with, we talk about the so what, here's why we did this silly thing. There's a real meaning behind it, but also the now what, how can you take this and put it into your creative strength training program? And we talk about different ways, like the paperclip, look around your space from time to time, grab a, an everyday object, and come up with some different uses for it. Um, a hairbrush. I've done this with a pizza box. But it's something you really need to, to work on. Um, any of you, I'd love to hear from you. Do you have ideas on how you might work on this part of creativity, pushing past? Well, I'll tell you, Kathy, that um, I, I do a creativity lecture to, through the presidential lecture series. Mm -hmm. And I use a Coke pan. And I tell these high schoolers to tell me all the ways that you can use this Coke can. Well, of course, they're looking at thinking of a single can. I didn't say that. 
I said, how do you use it? And they're all sort of staring at the paper. They come up with maybe four or five, but if they think outside the box, they may get to 20 or 25 in a minute or so. And I start sharing with them all the outlandish stuff that they could have. And they're going, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. So yes, I, I use that same um, sort of principle to talk with my high schoolers. The other thing that I do, you started talking about how we were all creative. And I start the lecture by saying, how many of you got up this morning and made decisions about what you're wearing? After I've asked them, are they creative? And only a few people raised their hand. And That's so I said, great. we all are creative because we all have jeans and t-shirts and things, but you all wear them differently. You put things together in a different way. So you are being a creative being. You just don't think of yourself as that. And then I have a couple of others that I might share a little later with pencils and and other things. So I'd like to hear what other people have. Oh yeah, and I would love to hear more from you as well. If you wanna share later, that'd be great. Yes, others, what do you do to help your students push past those first obvious answers? Kathy, uh, thank you actually. I also watched one of your uh, lecture series and I think you would give uh, four things do something new every day. So that was the one thing that I took in this semester. So I teach in a chemical engineering sophomore class and it's usually a math based class. So all they do is solve math. Now this time I say, okay, what if I ask them, make your coffee, make your juice or whatever that you make every morning and what are the different amounts you're putting? Can you uh, calculate your own juice or uh, milk or whatever you're making? Can you make the compositions and let me know that what uh, percent of uh, sugar that you are using in your coffee or coffee mix? So, and the, they have to make a one minute video for that and upload it on Canvas. And I think when I watched it with my son, uh, he loved it. And I showed them in class that uh, uh, that one of your classmates did this way. Uh, how did you do it? And they all loved it. So the response is uh, very good. So yeah, thank you. I got that idea. That from. is fabulous. I, I'm stealing the video idea. That is great to have them do the feedback that way. Love it. Ah. All right. Anybody else have things to share? All right, so I, there's more, there's more. Um, there's our list. So we, we looked at a couple of examples that I use and then that y'all are using to help our students push past the obvious answers and practice that process. Um, the next one I wanna look at is using self-imposed constraints to, to be creative. Some things I do, um, this semester, in fact, I'm teaching our version of freshman experience. Um, and this is just a quick, just fun, I threw this out there and I said, tell me you're a student at Kansas State University without saying I'm a student at Kansas State University. So I'm using self-imposed constraints and they have to know their, their subject matter, right? They have to know about Kansas State University in order to, to do this. So what if we flipped it a bit? What if I said to you, tell me that you teach at Kansas State University without saying I teach at Kansas State University. I'd love to hear it. I'd love to meet you, talk to me. How about I start? Hi, my name is Kathy Brockway and I teach at a university that loves its purple ice cream. Anybody else wanna try? I don't know if you can see Kathy, but there are people answering in the chat. Awesome, I just opened it, let's see. Oh, okay. Ah, okay, you, you teach at a university where you only wear purple. Oh, and I, I, I'm sorry, Don, it is your hashtag. We're just playing, we're just playing. Um, that's great. All right, Melissa. Great point. I believe that validating creative attempts as well as modeling them can help students feel safe to take risks with creativity. 
I also tell them repeatedly there aren't right, wrong answers when I pose a question that can be answered in multiple ways. Melissa, that is a great point. And I, I wanna kind of add on to that. Again, we do things sometimes in our classroom that maybe quash the creativity and we don't mean to. Like, you know, you have a student that asks these questions during class that are maybe off on a tangent a bit. Celebrate that. You don't have to let it take over the class, but you know, celebrate it, maybe answer it later, whatever's appropriate, but you wanna promote that creativity. Great, great comment, Melissa. Great comment. Okay. Um, and so my freshmen had fun with this. We heard some really great responses to, I'm a student at Kansas State University without really saying it. Let me check the chat box. Oh, in a small apple, I wear a gown. Yes, Tim, big gold star on that. Um, fabulous. Okay, so it's just a quick example of using a self-imposed constraint. I work at the home of Willie the Wildcat. Yes, yes. That's the kind of, I can hear Wabash Cannonball in my office almost every afternoon. Yeah, y'all are doing well. I help students develop their minds and reach their goals at a school where red and blue <laughs> must be combined into purple, not at that other school. Um, okay, so I think you got the hang of this. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, it's anything like this, you, you can run it in, very quickly in a class. Tell them why we're doing it right? A self-imposed constraint can make us more creative. So name it, make it fun, and repeat. All right, another way I, I use self-imposed constraints focuses around the number six. Can you tell I'm an accountant? I'm always throwing out sixes. Okay, here's, here's the thing. Here's the legend. The legend is Ernest Hemingway was once challenged to write a novel in just six words. And this is supposedly what he came up with. So based on that, you'll find a lot of stuff out there where people are writing their own six word memoirs, the story of their life in six words. Lots of websites are out there, books, it's a thing. And so I have my students, my freshmen, again, in, in our version of freshman experience, I have them write their life story in six words. And it's creative, it's fun. And again, I name it. I tell them why we're doing this. You've only got six words. You got to get down to the nitty gritty. Tell me the good stuff, right? And you also have to tell me or give me something that would make me want to read the book. Um, and so we did this in class very quickly. So these are handwritten all except one. Um, don't get comfortable. It's all changing. Always put family and farm first. Big flashy robots get my attention. We have a robotics degree. I think that might be what it refers to. From two wheels to two wings, I would say that person is the pilot. Um, circling interests, a few paths, one goal. I live for agriculture and aviation. Marine veteran, cancer can't stop me. Stupid plan ideas have good outcomes. I'm not throwing away my shot. And then this student, oh, here, from dirt roads to high skies. Again, I think another pilot. This student told me what he thought about the uh, assignment. <clears throat> My life is not easily summarized. I still wanna read the book, still wanna read the book. And so um, again, just a, a couple of examples of how I use self-imposed constraints to help students with their creativity. We all face constraints, right? Budget constraints, time constraints, every assignment there are constraints, but how can you amp it up just a little bit more? So after we do these activities in my class, again, I hit the so what, um, creative problem solvers use self-imposed constraints to inspire. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Do you have any activities similar to this that, that you use? How do you amp up the self-imposed? Ah, someone is doing six word essays. I'm reading the chat. Good. Yes. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put this other person on the spot as well. Uh, Leslie and I both teach first year students and okay. almost every project in design studio we give them has self-imposed constraints. So you're either looking at a certain size sheet that you're working with, a certain series of elements that you're working with, uh, some key words that you're responding to or writing your own statement about your intent, all of those things then create an imposed constraint. 
sometimes individual teachers in the sections provide other imposed constraints, like you can only use three planes as opposed to five. So Leslie, why don't you share some of the constraints that, but since you're on the committee that, that does that curriculum, can you say something about it? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about for one of our exercises is uh, exploring proportion systems. And some of us just only do one proportion system in the exercise, like the golden section. Um, and for those of you who may not remember this from geometry, the golden section is a proportional relationship that is uh, seen in nature in things like conch shells and uh, sunflower seed spirals in, in the center of it. Um, but it's amazing, even with something that is, you know, that you can express as a proportional relationship, um, how much variation you can get in it. And a lot of times, you know, the students are just kind of like, this is boring. Um, but, you know, you push them and of course they discover, you know, all sorts of new worlds. You discover 17 new worlds every semester, just in the golden section. Fabulous example. And, and like you said, you know, kind of highlighting for it for them that look, look at it, look at all this we were able to do with, with this particular constraint. Great. I've got one. Yes, name, please talk. My name's Chuck. I'm an acting teacher, among other things. And in acting, uh, a lot of new students often rely on their face as their primary tool for saying who their character is. And uh, we frequently use mask work to force students to try to express themselves in other ways. Now everybody's forced to wear a mask and it becomes part of our standard. Uh, so another way we've been, I've been using is uh, asking people to tell stories uh, with gibberish language, making up sounds that don't use actual the sp spoken word, but are making sounds and using inflection and other tools to help express what they're trying to uh, get across. It's a, just pushing new constraints on them to force them to try new means. That is awesome. I, did that, I, did that, I was going to say, I did that with my uh, granddaughter, my four-year-old granddaughter. Uh, her parents aren't too impressed, though. So. Come up with their, his, her own language, right? That's great. Oh, Chuck, well done. I love it. Any, anybody else have, have ways that you focus on self-imposed constraints? I like to do emotional check-ins um, with my social work students and they're only allowed to choose one of the four core emotions, mad, sad, glad, or afraid. They sometimes wanna pick two or three. And I said, no, you have to pick the primary one that you're feeling today. And so that gets them to focus in on that we're feeling. I love, Deb, is that you? I can't see. Yes, that's me. Yeah, I love that. Okay, and that would help my brain because Deb knows I'm always going a million different directions. Right there. You gotta, you gotta pick one. That's great. Okay, good. So we've looked at a couple pieces of my pledge that I put on on my um, on the worksheet. I want to jump into I question assumptions. I question assumptions. And you may have done this activity already, perhaps, um, but it centers around a pig. Let me check the chat box before we move on. Ah, before we go on. Okay, Dawn says putting maximum limits like words time on everything. Yes, great, great, great. Yeah, Melissa, I agree on the mask thing. Perfect, okay. All right, so here's, here's a pig and here's, here's why I have the pig on the screen. Um, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, yeah, yeah, and pigs might fly, right? Yeah, it's almost a put down. Like you, you'll say something's gonna happen or I'm gonna do X, Y, Z. And someone says, yeah, yeah, and pigs might fly. Okay, well, here's how a creative might take that. A creative might say, well, how might they? How might they fly? So we're gonna play a little today, just for a few minutes. I want you, I'll put you in Zoom breakout rooms. And for just a few minutes, I want you to think of as many ways as possible as you can get a pig to fly. And then I want you to keep going. 
And again, for just a few minutes, and then we'll come back and share a few highlights. So any questions on your mission before I, before we do breakout rooms? All right, we should all be back. All right, I am so excited to hear a highlight or two. Um, hopefully I had some fun, just we, we didn't have very long. And when I've run this in class, I do just take a few minutes and let him play with it. So um, room one, Adelaide, you want to give me a highlight. What was one of the, your favorite answers or pass it off your call? So I can pass it off to Troy. Troy, give me a favorite. How are you going to get a pig to fly? Oh, Troy, you're on. Okay, I got it. It just there took me a while to find it. It's okay. <laughs> okay, let me share. There's a, I'm dressing a pig up fly, no. style fly. You know, I don't know. I, I never wasn't really sure what that term meant, but fly. <laughs> That's fabulous. Room, or, yeah, room one. Well done. Well done. Wow. Um, room two, Ashley, you want to share or hand it off? Give me one highlight. Yeah, we actually talked about dressing fly as well, um, but I'll, I'll contribute something new. We said pole vaulting. Oh, yeah. Getting a little athletics involved. Exactly. Yeah. What, put the pig under the arm and go for it. Yeah. Or shot put either way. That works. That works. All right. Room three, Chuck, you want to give me a highlight or pass it off? Where's Chuck? How about Mike? Mike Chuck was muted. Chuck oh, okay. was muted. We, you know, Chuck has it covered. He's got a cut. He's he actually came. Where's up Chuck? With Chuck, like give a, me a highlight. Sorry about that. Uh, pigs in blimps, or as we call them, pimps. <laughs> well, that would be a creative fact, would it not? Wow. Okay, I like it a lot. That works. Okay, it's catchy. Um, <laughs> catchy. 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 Room four, Andy, I believe it was. Did I write that down right? Maybe I didn't. Is that me, Andy? Yes. I think Talk I was in to me. Four. Talk to me. We went on a big uh, inspiration, inspired by kids' movies kick. So like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Car, being pulled by balloons like in Up, uh, Magic Carpets, being carried by small little birds on a blanket. Uh, but yeah, basically we went through like all the movies we know where animals or something. It's very Disney. Yes. 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 I like it. I like it a lot. Um, room five, Joelle, you want to take it? Sure. Just my computer's going a little slowly. Oh, uh, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I think two were in conflict. One was genetic engineering and pixie dust. Could, not sure which way to go with that. I like both of them. I like both of them. Well done, room five. Room six, Melissa, you want to share a highlight? Melissa doesn't have a microphone, but oh. a lot of ours have been taken. I'm trying to think of something new. Um, feeding them helium was an idea that came up. Oh, I haven't heard that one. <laughs> Nicely done. All right. Uh, let me check the check the chat box. Okay, <laughs> a football pigskin. Well done, Deb. Well done. All right. So let me get my screen up here again. Don, can you see my screen? Andy, can you? Yes, see I can. Sorry, oh, right, I, I have my go. thumb up. You couldn't see it. Sorry. It's all good. Um. I've had my classes, again, do, do this. Um, I think you hit several of these. In the semi being hauled, semi gets air, jumps a gap. Uh, helium balloons, hauling pigs and airplanes for a very wealthy client. And then you, someone noted this, they evolved to have wings in the future because they keep getting eaten by humans. So again, just a fun, quick activity that you can conduct in class. And the so what, you know, wh why, why are we doing this? And I remind my students, you are gonna to have to challenge assumptions to be creative. You have to be willing, when you go into an office space, let's just use it as, as an example, and you wanna do something and someone says to you, we've tried it. it, it doesn't work. You need to learn to be able to ask why. Why didn't it work? How can we go about it in a different way? 
but I, I really prime my students on being willing and able to, to question those as assumptions. Do y'all do any assignments that, that ask students to do, to do that? Probably all the time, right? Anybody want to offer an activity? I like to ask my students to think about, tell me something that seems good but is bad or something that seems bad that is good. So I like people to kind of think about things in more nuanced ways. It's fabulous, yeah. So it's kind of an op ticket in the opposite. Yeah, and it's and I teach psychology classes. It'll be like, when is helping bad? You know, when is aggression good? Those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah well done. Okay, good. That's a great example. I ask my students to uh, ground truth um, their their analyses. So you know, we take drawings of spaces, and uh, they have to distill them to their components. Um, and it's very easy to get seduced by the, you know, authority of a plan and that one's experience would match that, but they have to go out there and, you know, say like, is this actually, you know, how I experience the center line or is there something else going on that's shaping that, et cetera. Absolutely. That's a great example because yeah, once it gets the formalized plan, it's probably a little scary to question. That's great. Okay. I say that I teach a I teach a community development class, and uh, these are for planners. Mm -hmm. So when uh, they they set up analyses all semester on a particular city or neighborhood where there is a development going on that's gone awry, and their job is to be the planner who would take this thing that's not working figure out what it is and try to figure out what would they do to move the community or the developer or the um, contractor along, but you first have to understand why it went awry. And so they're using research to get as much information about the place and it's not a place that they've lived or live in now. So it has to be something that they gather data and, and actually contact the, the stakeholders to find out what's what went wrong and how to fix it. Fabulous. That's great. Um, Chuck has a chat. I asked students to discuss whether Oedipus was a hero or a villain, then ask if fate absolves him. All of these are great examples of, of us having our students challenge those assumptions, being willing to, to put themselves out there. So a um, couple of other just quick activities I wanted to, to share with you, and I want you to keep talking to me as well. So I'm powered by empathy and relentless curiosity. I'll do what's, what I call the photo essay in class. Um, I'll give them a photo and I'll say, tell me the story. So I'm gonna ask the same of you. Looking at this photo, can you tell me the story? I love these. I love these. These are things I do with my class. And so it's a great activity, isn't it's it? It's a great exercise. I'll tell you what, it's even more important when you add to that a historic overlay and ask them to tell you what you think happened in this history. Yes. So, and the adults, these are elderly or seniors, and they come up with the craziest stories. I love it. It's, it's That's amazing. fabulous. Yeah. And it, it just, I think it's, again, I use it kind of as an empathy building tool, as a just a start to talking about empathy, but you got to put yourself in, in their shoes, right? You got to kind of get a feel for it. And um, okay, <laughs> Troy Harding, we've got a triple flip going on on the trapeze. I love that story. Um, we have students act out what happens before and after the image was taken. Oh, Joelle, that's wonderful. I might be stealing that. Um, <laughs> Chuck, that was incredible. What do you mean she came in second? You guys have, this is great, great stories. And so I'll, I'll do things like this. I'll throw out a random photo and say, tell me the story. And then I use it as a springboard for talking about empathy and relentless curiosity. Um, you've got to have it. 
you're going to be working with people on teams all the time and they, they come at it from a different perspective. And I'll throw in silly stuff like, you know, I found this on social media and it made me think of empathy, right? Extreme empathy. I wonder what my dog named me. And so we talk about, I'll throw that on the screen and talk about, do you put yourself in that other person's shoes? Do you really try to understand um, that, that other person's view? And the reason I do this, and I, again, I talk to my students about it, is you've got to have that empathy and that curiosity if you want to maintain your creativity. It's important. It's critical. Um, Kathy? Yes. Very quickly, I think that we don't use photography enough in our classes. Uh, there is something called photo language and photo voice. And the beauty of both of them is that you're asking your community to bring you photographs of where they live when they cannot talk about it themselves. But by seeing a photo, usually the shy ones, will, if you ask them to explain why you took this picture, they'll answer you. But if you ask them what's going on in your community that is um, a problem, a concern, a challenge, you might not get very many answers, but if you leave them with a camera and have them go take pictures, they come back and they tell you in their photos. So photo voice is what that is. Photo language is a little different. And I've been trying to teach my planners to use these two tools since they don't draw, that they have another tool that's just as expressive. So photo language is about the interpretation of photos. Bill and Deb, I think, are on this call. We need to steal that for freshman experience. We could play with that. La Barbara, that is so cool. Love it. Um, let me check the chat here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, photo voice. I wrote it down. Um, when I do things like this, when possible, I usually offer up my own story. So I want to do the same for you. So I showed you a photo. I asked you, you know, to tell me the story. I got some interesting ones. Here's my story. So that's where I So just a fun way to end an activity like that. And, and we talk about all the stories are correct. Everyone in that, in that photo, in that video would have had a different take on it. And so again, I just use it as a springboard into empathy, team building, that kind of a discussion. Um, and I focus on the, the empathy piece. The last item I wanted to share with you is how I, I try to help them break out of established patterns, which is kind of a big deal, I think, for an accountant. Um, so I wanted to quickly show you accounting and limericks. What the heck, right? Do they really go together? I argue they do. Um, Bill Jenneru inspired this activity, if he's still on here. He inspired me to do this. Um, so what, what I did was we talked about what is a limerick? Well, it's a five line poem. Lines one, two, and five rhyme. Lines three and four rhyme. I challenged them to write a limerick about accounting. Before we did this, we brainstormed everything we'd learned so far in the semester on the board. We wrote it all out. I had them take a picture of that brainstorm, and I said, go home and write me a limerick. And they did not disappoint. Um, remember Luca Pacioli. He's the father of accounting. So we have Mr. Luca Pacioli knows within the statement of cash flows, expenses are paid, money is to be made. He hopes for a net inflow. Fabulous, right? Oh my gosh, I was so impressed. How to choose to make or buy, pick the choice with cost not high, sort through the relevance, write down your sent sentiments, tell the board to certify. They had so much fun and they learned. <laughs> they reviewed for the final um, just by thinking about everything we had learned. Um, 
There was once was an account called accounts receivable. Its importance is quite inconceivable. On the left, it's a debit. On the right, it's a credit. And the act of balancing it is achievable. Um, I wanted to hit this one. Net worth is the old bottom line. And for others, I spend all my time to come up with this number. And sometimes I wonder why I'm working on theirs, not mine. I It's just amazing when you throw this out, the students are, are eager to do this. I included this one because the student didn't follow the instructions. There's nothing about accounting in this, but I gave him credit because he pulled on my heartstrings. Um, I have an incredible 80s music t-shirt collection. Anybody? Okay. And I wear them on Fridays. So people know my feeling about music and they know my first concert was Air Supply at what was the Salina Bicentennial Center. And so here's a Kathy teaches finance at K-State. Marrying a pilot was her fate. Like time, like him, time can fly. How fun was air supply? Experiences are what make life great. So they, they nailed it. Now, again, people might say poetry, accounting, come on, you're wasting time. I disagree. I did research and reading and writing poetry, they are finding helps you get comfortable with ambiguity, helps you become more empathetic helps with your problem solving abilities, all things I want my K-State graduates to have. And so I plan to double down on this assignment in somehow, some way, um, I'm gonna make it bigger. Something else I do to kind of uh, break out of established patterns is at the beginning of a class, I'll, I'll uh, hand out circles and I'll say, draw me something, draw me anything you can think of, get creative. And they take these circles and they turn them into things that I would never have seen. Uh, it's very interesting. So we have an animal. We have the Steelers, the football team. We we have yin and yang. Um, we have a turtle. We have a camera. You know, they, they come up with some amazing things. And it takes two minutes at the beginning of the class, and it kind of warms them up and gets their creative juices flowing, so to speak. And it helps them break connections. When they're looking at a circle, they turn it into something else completely. Let me check the chat box. Ah, I see Play-Doh to create and recreate a piece of art. Yes, stealing. There are some great, we vote on a class mascot. Love it. All right, so good stuff in the chat. Um, the so what on the, on the poems and the 30 circles, just inspiring them to get out of their frame, to do something odd and different. Um, and I encourage them to continue to do that. So we've looked, and I know it's been breakneck pace, but we've looked at some examples of things that I've done. We've heard from a few of you as to what you do. I always preach this to my students. Um, again, I, I name it. I all the time, I name it, name it, name it. And I, I encourage them to be very intentional about what they let into their life because they're building their creative lineage. Um, they need to pick the books to read, the conversations to have, the movies to watch, the friendships to be a part of. Um, you know how your mom always says to choose your friends wisely because that's who you become, right? And so I talk to my students a lot about it that they've got to continue to practice their creativity. And this is part of it, creating that creative lineage, a family tree, so to speak. And I encourage them to be intentional. So with that, we're out of time. I'll stick around if there are questions or activities you want to share further. The chat box is full of some really cool things that I'll be stealing. Um, but with that, thank you so much for having me here today. I had a blast. If you'd all join me in thanking Kathy Brockway for sharing with us an amazing presentation today on creative and innovation, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Kathy, thank you so much. That was that was great. I think I have a lot of awesome ideas that I can now use my classes. We were talking about at the beginning of this session, how engaged a lot of our students are right now, how energized they are for doing this. And I think this is just going to make it easier to nurture that engagement moving forward. I really appreciate that. Um, before we finish up, I do just remind people to be post event surveys to kind of complete, especially if you're pursuing those uh, professional development certificates or fellow status at the TLC. And next week, we're going to have Andy Thompson from the Office of Student Life talking about how we promise, how we follow through on the promise of support. And that is one of our need to know events. Um, but Kathy, again, thank you so much for your time and for sharing with us your energy and your thoughts. That was, that was amazing. Absolutely. Thank you.
If anyone wants to stick around for a second, happy to do that. Um, otherwise, have a great rest of your week and happy teaching.